Okay. Uh, this is the uh, the third or the fourth rollout of this expert evidence seminar. Uh, it has a formula, and the formula is basically a primer on the new expert evidence rules, which those of you who have attended before will have heard. And then from then, the real purpose of it is to bring you absolutely bang snap, fresh up to date with the latest authorities. Um, so again, for those of you who've been here before, openly acknowledge that some of what I'm going to move through at a fairly rapid rate you've heard before, but the material that Adele, Julie and I will be presenting on the case law, with a few exceptions that are remarkably notable, is all fresh. And that'll be the way this seminar always works. So again, please excuse a certain amount of replication and uh, again, a small amount of duplication, but basically every time it's going to be what's happened in the last six months. Um, let's make a start. The overview of the um, presentation is, as I said, I'm going to start with the October 2016 Federal Court Expert Evidence Practice Note, which is, everyone is becoming increasingly familiar with. Um, brief reminder of the finer points of the note, the fact that it's now, uh, to use the words, the contagion has spread to Victoria and New South Wales, uh, it's heading through the rest of the country as we speak, and then an update on the latest cases. Um, there has been a useful new development generally, and that is that UK jurisprudence is back. Um, since Brexit and the end of the, effectively the impending end of the European overlay, um, British decisions are now increasingly, and we're seeing the trend, certainly I'm seeing it in Melbourne, and it's coming here as well, British decisions are now starting to take on the significance that they might have had 40 or 50 years ago, but haven't had for a while. So every one of these seminars, one of the things that we will be doing is bringing you up to speed on the latest and greatest UK decisions, because frankly, they're being treated as if they're coming from the seventh state. Um, the Federal Court Expert Practice Note comprises a general practice note a harmonised expert witness code of conduct and concurrent expert evidence guidelines. And again, I promise I'm going to slow down when we get to the good stuff, but this is just the prefatory material that you need to know. Um, there is a thing called an overarching purpose, and it's trite, but it's becoming more and more significant every month. Um, it's exactly as is on the screen. When dealing with expert witnesses and expert evidence, parties and their legal reps must at all time comply with their duties associated with the overarching purpose in the Federal Court Act. And then we have, what the hell is it? Section 37M of the Act. It's to facilitate disputes according to law and as quickly and expensively and efficiently as possible. Yep, all good motherhood stuff. Subsection two, it includes the following objectives. Just determination, efficient use of judicial and admin resources, efficient disposal of the court's overall caseload, disposal of the proceedings in a timely manner. Now ease the fun the resolution of disputes at a cost that is proportionate to the importance and complexity of the matters in dispute. We are starting to see cases now that are coming through that reflect this case note where the judges are saying, listen, what you did with your experts, listen, what you did with your witnesses was disproportionate. You spent too much money on your legal fees. You spent too much money on your counsel. You spent too much time in preparation. It's on, it's happening. And it's all stemming from this, which is again now spread to Victoria and New South Wales. Section 37N, the parties are to act consistently with the overarching purpose. Parties to a civil proceeding before the court must conduct the proceedings, including negotiations, underline, underline, in a way that is consistent with the overarching purpose. A party's lawyer in conduct proceedings must take account of the duty and assist the party to comply with the duty. Then, four, this is again where the fun is, in exercising the discretion to award costs in a civil proceeding, and you were hearing a case from Julia, albeit from the UK, which is great fun on this, the court or a judge must take account of any failure to comply with the duty imposed by subsection one or two. It's not, it's not may, it's must. Um, if a court or judge orders a lawyer to bear costs personally because of a failure to comply with the duty, the lawyer must not recover the costs from his or her client. Um, last session, we dealt with a case where exactly this happened. Um, it's on, it's live, I don't want to be duplicative, but it's happening in the jurisprudence right now. Okay, practice note, interaction with expert witnesses, and again, I'm gonna move through this fairly quickly. Most of you know all this stuff backwards, um, but it's codified now. <laughs> Why is it relevant? Because it all ties back to that damn overarching purpose. Expert is not a hired gun and must not be treated as such by the party or their lawyers. Avoid inappropriate communications when retaining or assist, instructing or assisting an expert. Um, again, this is merely codifying that which we've all known. Um, now, 
3.2 again, don't hire dirty experts. Um, and again, we've now have codified the concept of a dirty expert. In other words, an expert behind the scenes who you've got instructing in the background. Um, has this affected a year and a half on, um, are we still hiring dirty experts? And the answer is yes, but with much more tightly controlled scopes than we might have previously. Um, it is always useful to have an expert in the background who is monitoring what is going on and who is monitoring your own expert. But the good old days of effectively giving them, from my experience, ex the exact same scope as the expert that is hired to do the court's job, and then telling you effectively how to interact with your expert, those days, at least in my experience, are it's better to play it safe and say those days are over. Um, conference of experts. The court can order a conference of the experts, appoint a conference facilitator, and require a joint report. Um, the actual direction there is subject to any other order or direction of the court. The parties and their lawyers must not involve themselves in the conference of the experts process. You knew that already. The second sentence is a little more interesting. In particular, they must not seek to encourage an expert not to agree with another expert or otherwise seek to influence the outcome of the conference of the experts. Um, speaking from my own experience, it is possible in the past I may have regarded my role as being to effectively assist my expert to have their point of view accepted um, and to have the other expert agree with their point of view. I guess the only practical impact of that order there is certainly there have been some instances of some practitioners who have told their expert, you must not agree to X. For God's sake, don't say that. Um, um, there is another way to achieve exactly the same outcome, which is entirely compliant, which is, is this an opinion? This is, is this your opinion? Yes, it is. Um, is. Do you have any reservations? No, I don't. Um, do you intend to derogate from that opinion? No, I don't. If I put X, Y, or Z to you, would you change your opinion? Um, well, why would you put X, Y, or Z to me? Because the other expert in her report squarely puts it on there. So when that is put to you, are you going to change your view? Mm. If they say yes, if they say no, if they say maybe, um, then you've done your job as a practitioner in a way that is consistent with that rule. Experts' paramount duty, we all know this, is to assist the court impartially. Um, this overrides any duty to the, part, to the party retaining him. Okay, it formalises accepted practice. Um, the days of having a long report which doesn't contain a brief summary at the, at the start are over. Seen a couple this year, 2018, which still don't contain a brief summary. Please, for the love of God, get your expert to put a brief summary in. Um, require as expert to state matters that were once clawed out in cross-examination. Um, the extent to which any, ex any opinion involves the acceptance of another person's opinion, the identification of that other person, and the opinion expressed by that other person. Tests relied upon who carried them out, their qualifications. Get it out, get it loud, get it proud, make sure your expert does it. Practitioners have got to advise. Now, we have similar requirements in New South Wales. Practitioners to advise their clients as to the overarching purpose. There's those words. They're to consider the suitability of single experts, coin deported experts, and concurrent evidence. Um, these days, it's standard that they're going to be orders for expert evidence. Same assumption for conclaves and joint reports. There is a new rule. Where an expert witness is provided to a party a report for use in court and the expert thereafter changes his or her opinion on a material matter, the expert must forthwith provide to the party a supplementary report which must state, specify or provide the information referred to in the Clause 3 code requirements. Again, it's good common sense stuff, but it's worth bearing in mind. Um, New South Wales, again, the Expert Witness Code of Conduct. I'm not going to go through it painlessly, pay painfully, I'm sorry. Um, content of the report. Every report prepared by an expert witness must clearly state the opinion and must state, specify or provide, K, whether any opinion is not a concluded opinion because of insufficient research or insufficient data, and L, when the report is lengthy or complex, a brief summary of the report. Um, and I've added in there, somewhat controversially, that was not added, written by the solicitor and is more consistent than not with the opinions expressed in the body of the report. Okay, again, you can take it from here that the same things are in Victoria. I'm now going to hand over to Adele for um, what you're really here for, which is the cases. The 
first case which I'm going to talk about is um, BrisConnect Finance and Arup. This is a case which involves large complex um, uh, litigation involved $2.2 billion and involving um, jointly um, instructing two experts and a letter of instruction. Um, however, despite its application to large complex litigation, it does apply to smaller litigation. Uh, the case alleged misleading and uh, deceptive conduct with respect to traffic forecasts which were made um, by our causing bridge connections, as I said before, a loss of $2.2 billion. The central point and the expert evidence related to Arup's work, whether the traffic forecasts were based on reasonable grounds, whether the competent traffic forecaster acting reasonably and would have produced the traffic forecasts in question. Briz Connections uh, uh, instructed an a expert named Michael Vettich. He was instructed in 2014 at a time where he had been instructed in other similar litigation. Uh, no letter of instruction was provided. He continued to um, prepare his report in 2014 on the basis of his letter of instruction in the previous litigation. This particular litigation included um, files of 95,000 uh, 95, files and he insisted that he would have a team of um, assistants and other experts including his son. In July of 2015 he unfortunately had a uh, foot infection which lasted for six months. It was at this point in time that Briz Connection said, okay, we will now uh, jointly retain your son, Tim Vetich, Jr. It was only at this time when a letter of instruction was provided. Uh, between July of 2015 and September, 30th September of 2016 is when the final report was prepared and given and both senior, uh, Vetich Senior and Vetich Junior signed it. When the matter came on for hearing on the 3rd of October 2017, Arup, um, uh, objected to the admissibility of this report of the 30th of September 2016 and their objection was there's no apparent reason of the opinions expressed were wholly or substantially based on the knowledge of either Vetich Senior or Vetich Junior and therefore section 79 of the Evidence Act is not engaged which of course is the expert exception to the opinion rule. A voir dire was held um, by Justice Lee in the, in the Federal Court on the 16th of October and this citation relates to the judgment that was handed down with respect to, to the voir dire. Interesting that Briz Connections um, departed from the joint report and the joint instruction that was given in July of 2015. What they did is they said, we no longer rely on both Fetish Junior and Fetish Senior, we only rely on Fetish Senior, at which point Fetish Senior issued a new report, removing pronouns and a small amount of drafting. It's unclear why they changed their position in respect to this, uh, but Justice Lee in this judgment said that this could be described uncharitably as throwing one traffic expert under the bus. Despite this change of position, Justice Lee did continue to consider whether um, joint opinions are admissible. At the voir dire, only Vetish Senior gave evidence. Um, Justice Lee accepted that Vetish Senior had read each and every chapter many times, considering that the report had been um, provided and drafted over about 14 months. Vetish Senior held every one of the opinions expressed in the report and he had not consciously modified or changed his opinions in order to reach a consensus opinion with Vetich Jr. And there were not opinions in the port which he did not hold. And so on the basis that, that these particular um, observations were made by Justice Lee, Justice Lee made a difference between compromise and collaboration. Compromise being inadmissible, collaboration being admissible. With respect to this observation, Justice Lee said, as to the former, so compromise, this will usually involve a witness reaching an opinion as a result of adopting an opinion of another without applying the witness's specialised knowledge. As to the latter, this will involve a witness applying their specialised knowledge following a discussion and debate between the witness and another. It is this latter process that discharges the witness's duties as an expert to test and refine their views 
and come to a considered opinion based on their knowledge, even though it may involve embracing a final view which might not have been initially evident. And it was because of this reasoning that it is imperative that Justice Lee noted that there is a difference between formulating opinion and giving the reasons and explanation in the report for that opinion. Justice Lee recognised uh, that there is some complexity in some litigation and that collaboration will occur. And it's in that that Justice Lee referred to it, that in a practical sense that both the practice note and the harmonised practice note allow for this collaboration to occur. In, partic in particular, paragraph 4.3 of the practice note, and I'll read, experts should willingly be prepared to change their opinion or make concessions when it is necessary or appropriate to do so, even if doing so would be contrary to any previously held or expressed view of that expert. Similarly, at paragraph 7.5 of the harmonised note, um, with respect to conference of experts, it states the court may order that a conference of experts occur in a variety of circumstances, including before the experts have reached a final opinion on a relevant question or the facts involved in a case. When this occurs, the court may order that the parties exchange draft expert reports and that a conference report be prepared for the use of the experts in finalising their reports. It was on this basis that Justice Lee held that um, uh, Vetish Senior's report was admissible. Uh, the other point that was made by Justice Lee in this matter was the letter of instruction. Noting back in the facts of this matter is that Vetish Senior was retained in 2014 with no letter of instruction. Vetish Senior and Vetish Junior were retained in July of 2015 with a letter of instruction, but then um, uh, they were given a further letter of instruction on or about the 30th of September 2016. And it was because that the final letter of instruction, um, which was so close to the finalisation of the report that Justice Lee was critical of. He made mention with respect to part 23.1.3d of the Federal Court rules, which require experts to refer to uh, questions and assumptions that they've been asked to give. If the letter of instruction is given so close to when the final report is made, then it makes almost, as using Justice Lee's words, the letter of instruction silly. The reason being is because there's no transparency between what the expert is being asked to assume and what they've gone ahead and done with the report. Following on from letter of instruction is independence. Uh, practice note 3.4 requires that any questions or assumptions provided to an expert should be provided in an unbiased manner and in such a way that the expert is not confined to addressing selective, irrelevant or immaterial issues. In this matter, in Aerial Capital and MM International, uh, Justice Farrell considered whether a particular expert, an accounting expert, um, had been influenced by the questions that had been provided by MM International. The case arose from Aerial Capital seeking winding up orders um, against MM International on the basis that they hadn't um, uh, paid a statutory demand of 56,000 arising from a judgment in the Magistrates Court of the ACT. MM Inter International did not seek to set aside that statutory demand and therefore under the Corporations Act there was a presumption uh, that MM International was insolvent. Uh, therefore, to prove that they were insolvent, MM International had the onus of proving this. Hence, they got in an expert called Robert Austin. He was a certified practicing accountant and a registered tax agent. Mr. Austin's affidavit effectively just annexed a balance sheet and included MM International's assets, liabilities, tax and comments regarding additional funds. And it was these additional comments that Justice Farrell had issues with. And the comments were, the company has access to additional funds, if required from the directors, family and from overseas affiliated entities. On the basis of the above information, it would appear that the company is able to meet its financial obligations as and when they fall due. This was the problematic statement. The above information has been supplied by the directors and supporting bank statements and no form of audit has been conducted by me. Mr Austin was cross-examined 
and he conceded that the only source documents that he had looked at were the bank documents and he wholly relied otherwise on what had been provided by the directors. It was because of this that Justice Farrell came to the conclusion that only scant weight could be provided, uh, scant weight, sorry, placed on Mr Austin's evidence and therefore um, the company was wound up. Following on with independence is the next case of uh, Shonika Guy and Crown Melbourne. The citation that's up there relates to um, uh, findings that were handed down in September of last year uh, with respect to expert evidence. Um, however, you all might be aware that the substantive judgment was handed down last Friday um, with respect to um, the uh, dismissal of the case against Crown Melbourne and Aristocrat. Aristocrat manufactured the dolphin uh, treasure poker machines and it was found that they were not mil uh, misleading and deceptive in any way. The judgment handed down in September related to objections that had been made to an affidavit uh, um, uh, filed by the applicant and relied on them um, with respect to deposing to the design and configuration of the Dolphin Treasure Machine and features on the machine that contributed to an addiction to poke machines. The objections that were taken by both Crown and Aristocrat and they included that Dr Livingston's affidavit was opinion evidence, did not comply with Rule 2311 and the opinions that were expressed in the affidavit were not wholly uh, relied on his study, training or experience. Interesting though that even though this um, affidavit was filed and, and relied on by the applicant, they didn't first rely on it as expert evidence. First, they said that the evidence by, deposed by Dr Charles Livingston was um, concerned with fact and not opinion. If that wasn't accepted by the court, the second basis was the extent that the opinion evidence relied upon uh, referred to um, uh, Dr Livingston giving evidence about what he saw, heard or perceived. Again, exceptions to both the hearsay and opinion rule. It was only on the third basis that they said, yes, it is expert evidence, but they conceded that it did not comply with Part 23 of the Federal Court Rules. What does Part 23 of the Federal Court Rules say? It defines what an expert is and it defines what expert evidence is. Expert is defined as meaning a person who has specialised knowledge based on the person's training, study or experience. And expert evidence is defined in the rules to mean evidence of an expert that is based wholly or substantially on the expert's specialised knowledge. All of that language is taken directly from Section 79 of the Evidence Act. Specifically as well, Part 2311 of the Federal Court Rules gives a party discretion to call expert evidence, but you can only call that evidence in the event that the expert report complies with 2313. So what does 2313 say? The report must be first signed by the expert who prepared it, two, contain an acknowledgement at the beginning of the report that the expert has read, understood and complied with the practice note, three, contain particulars of the training, study or experience by which the expert has acquired specialised knowledge, four, identify the questions that the expert was asked to address, which is what I mentioned before. Five, set out separately each of the factual findings or assumptions on which the expert opinion is based. Six, set out separately from the factual findings or assumptions each of the expert's opinions. Seven, set out the reasons for the opinion and eight, say that they comply with the practice note. Justice Mortimer said that because of the language used in part 23 but also section 79 that if any party were to rely on the exception of section 79 that all of the expert opinion report must comply with part 23 and must comply with the practice note. The reason for this is underlying all of that is the independence of the expert. Justice Mortimer relied on paragraph 41 of the practice note um, and the harmonised code which says that the role of the expert witness is to provide relevant and impartial evidence on his and her area of expertise. An expert should never mislead the court or become an advocate for the cause for the party uh, that has retained the expert. So what did um, Dr Livingston Everson say? He set out his 
training, his experience and his study. And he didn't resile from the fact that he had participated in a number of um, uh, trials to do with uh, poker machines, that he had bought a dolphin treasure machine. Um, he also conceded in his affidavit that prior to being retained by the applicant solicitors, he had provided the firm assistance in the operation of poker machines and the applicant's case. And also, he acknowledged that he had an opposition to gambling as a lawful activity. It's because of these things that Justice Mortimer said that there is no way that Dr Charles Livingston can be independent. But he was not criticised for this because at no time did he hold himself out to be independent. There was one comment that was made with respect to part 23 um, and the requirements to um, comply with that part in order to um, say that your evidence, uh, your, the evidence called by the expert is expert evidence. Um, Justice Mortimer acknowledged that there will be times when you don't strictly comply with part 23 and she acknowledged that there would be times where, as I read out before, part 23.13, where there might be the acknowledgement that they've read the practice note. Something simple or minor like that can be rectified if you were to put the um, witness into the uh, witness box. However, whole compliance or substantial compliance was not allowed. Um, the remaining case, which I've put in only because I found it humorous, um, was um, Nash and um, Demorage. Um, proprietary Limited. This case relates to taking judicial uh, notice of facts. So that's one way of proving case along with evidence. This case involved a um, collision of a prime mover and a truck uh, in Queensland. And the uh, plaintiff in the, um, this is on appeal, plaintiff in the magistrate's court had called a crash scene analysis to give evidence about the speed of the trucks and the prime mover, how long it would take to stop and where their blind spots were. Uh, where um, a judge or a magistrate might rely on um, taking notice of judicial facts, they must give notice to the parties so that they can provide submissions on it. This wasn't done in the magistrate's court uh, and it's unexplained why the magistrate did this. Um, we unfortunately don't have the benefit of the judgment in the magistrate's court, but what we did have is the, um, uh, the judgment in the district court, which relied on transcript of the magistrate's court with respect to the magistrate's decision to reject Mr. Ruler's expert evidence. So that was the crash scene analysis. Um, on appeal, Judge Clare observed, the transcript suggests his honor did not read the report. He also did not accept Mr. Ruler's experience was an area of recognised expertise. His Honour found that he did not need to call a so-called expert to analyse the evidence. He considered himself to be sufficiently qualified through general driving experience, a period of driving smaller army trucks 30 years ago, involvement in crash and bash cases and his common sense. Uh, Judge Clare uh, noted on appeal that it was only to take judicial notice of a fact can only be something that is notorious or common knowledge. For an example is that asbestos is dangerous. Um, Judge Clare ruled that Mr Ruler was qualified to testify as to the crash analysis and therefore his uh, evidence was admissible and remitted the matter back to the magistrate's court. Um, Her Honour also noticed that there were three um, uh, pieces of evidence um, affidavits that were filed in the magistrate's court, both from each party and a lay witness. Judge Clare said that the lay witness did not in itself rule the expert evidence inadmissible. The test was whether Mr Ruler assisted the court, and that's going back to the overriding duties of um, expert witnesses and independents. And it's a question of whether it can strengthen, refute or supplement any other evidence that's before the court. We all have bad days. We all have days where, hopefully not too often, where judges criticise us. We all have days where judges give us a very hard time. We all have days where judges 
at a superior court level say unfortunate things in judgments. And then we have this. <laughs> um, Bank of Ireland and Watts. Um, High Court of Justice, Queen's Bench Division, Technology and Construction Court, Colston J, who's basically the UK equivalent of Hammerschlag. Terribly experienced, terribly experienced judge who's every now and again gets pushed too far. Um, the Bank of Ireland is the Bank of Ireland. It's exactly what you'd expect it to be. Watts is a quantity surveyor. Um, it's a condition of a finance facility that a quantity surveyor, Watts, be engaged to act on the bank's behalf in checking the costings supplied by the borrower and approving requests for drawdowns from that facility. Plan specs and details of subcontractor professional team can be obtained from the customer. So Watts, QS, takes the gig. The bank extends a 1.4 million pound facility to a developer. Giant construction, middle of York, everything goes wrong. Um, exactly as you'd predict. Um, developer goes bust, and then the bank in its genius decides that there must be a price. So they go after Watts, and they say that Watts, the surveyor, has been negligent. The judge hears from the usual two experts, one for each side. It starts out badly. At paragraph 58, the judge says, it's necessary to make some general observations to the role of as to expert evidence in this case relating to Watts's performance of his role, of their role. Although it is commonplace for counsel to submit that their expert's evidence should be prepared wholesale to that of the expert on the other side, that is not usually a justified approach. But in this case, I've concluded that for a variety of reasons outlined below, and there's the first sign of blood in the water, that the written and oral evidence of Mr. Vosser adduced on behalf of the bank was unreliable. So wherever he disagreed with Mr. Whitehead, the expert called on behalf of Watts, I've concluded that I should prefer Mr. Whitehead's evidence. Okay, the judge then at paragraph 5.2.2 starts talking about independence. He says some hurtful things about Mr. Voss's independence. He says, I concluded on the evidence that Vossa was not a properly independent witness it was clear that the bank was his principal client, providing the vast majority of his work and fees, and that he'd spent most of the past few years acting for the bank as an expert witness in actions against monitoring QSs arriving out of the GFC. He told me that until now, these had all been resolved by alternative dispute resolution, so that this was the first of the disputes that had come to court. He was, I think, unaware of the difference between acting as the bank's advocate in, say, a mediation and his duties to the court when giving expert evidence. So first indicia of the horror to come. We have an expert who is the bank's hired gun in cases against QSs while the bank's trying desperately to recover its GFC losses. This guy is acting in mediations, he's acting in arbitrations, he's not acting in proceedings that are under the jurisdiction of the court. First problem. Voss's close relationship with the bank was borne out by many things. His unrealistic <laughs> approach to the allegations. His attempt to mislead the court his application of the wrong test, his unreasonable intransigence which led to his refusal to make any concessions whatsoever for the love of God, and the fact that many of his criticisms which he did not withdraw were so unpersuasive that the bank quite properly declined even to plead them as allegations of professional negligence. I deal briefly with each of these matters in turn below. They support either separately or cumulatively my conclusion that Mr Vossa was not an independent or reliable expert witness. So when you're preparing a CLE, you're always hoping to God that there is a couple of cases out there that just might help you. And Chief of the Destroyer, Goddess of Litigation, helped us out with this one. This is wholesale. The lack of realism, in which the judge says some hurtful things about Mr. Voss's fees and leaves a very clear implication hanging in the air. And this is actually fascinating. Watts were paid £1,500 for producing the actual report itself. So that's the cost of producing the report for which they're being sued for 1.4 mil. Judge says, as you can see on the screen, that modest fee reflected the fact that they were not expected to do their own detailed calculations of cost, etc. I regard the size of the fee as good evidence of the limited nature of the service which Watts were expected to provide at that stage. That must be compared with Mr. Vossa, Mr. Vossa the expert's approach. 
In addressing Watts' performance, his first report, together with appendices, filled a lever arch. He incurred 24,000 quid in carrying out that report. And the bank's solicitors incurred a similar sum in respect of their commissioning, checking and liaison work in connection with that same report. We're going to stop there. Um, we went back to the start to the overarching obligation and the proportionality question. Watch what happens next. Thus, while Watts' IAR cost just 1500 the report and associated work done to criticise it cost more than 30 times that amount. In my view, this is a clear indication that the criticisms which have generated are based on an entirely unrealistic expectation of what it was that Watts was required to do. Okay, this is all great fun, but there are some, actually some practical lessons that come out of this, which is for love of God, make sure that when you engage your expert, there is proportionality. Um, and this is again starting to come through in the authorities that are heading their way through the courts in Australia as well. This is, if it is a 15, if the fee that has been paid is $1,500, then for the love of God, don't spend $25,000 on your expert. Um, be proportionate. And if you do spend $25,000 on your expert, because everyone in this room knows that there, always, there is always an exceptional case, if you do, make sure that the clear implication cannot be hanging in the air that your expert just might be willing to say things in exchange for a great deal of money because this is exactly where this judge is going. The judge is not mincing, the judge is not mincing implications. Furthermore, Mr Voss's criticisms were not limited to a single report. He produced a second detailed report and then the week before the trial another lever arch of new folders documents purporting to address the key paragraphs of his witness statement. Mr. Vossa said that this material was designed to show that the three properties were not proper compar comparables, a point which he could have made in his second expert report but failed to do so. This excessive industry only confirmed my view that Vossa was prepared to go to any lengths to shore up the bank's case. At a certain point in time, and you can see where this is going, you're going to start feeling sorry for Mr. Vossa because you're going to think to yourself, hang on, hang on, there were other people involved here. There was a bank. Oh yes, there were counsel. Counsel to which the judge expresses his indebtedness in paragraph 3.1 of his judgment. Um, there are instructing solicitors. There were teams of lawyers involved, and yet it is Mr. Vo it is Mr. Vossa who gets hung out to dry. Mr. Justice Vickery in the Supreme Court of Victoria, confronted with a similar matter last year, did not do the same. He took out the expert, he took out the solicitors, and then he took out the barrister. We do things differently here. This case is... This is a cautionary tale in so many respects. So again, it's fun, but there are big lessons from this one. In which the judge doubles down, attempt to mislead. One of the major issues raised in Mr Voss's expert report was his uncompromising view that Watts were obliged to start from scratch and produce their own detailed breakdown of the construction costs. 1,500 quid, 24,000. He justified this approach by referring to the relevant guidance which he quoted as saying, the project monitor may have to develop his or own elemental breakdown. This was a highly misleading quotation. The full passage reads, when involved with smaller developments and inexperienced clients and contractors, the project monitor, while strictly responsible to the client, may be asked to perform a hand-holding exercise with the client and may have to develop his or her own elemental breakdown of construction costs to prove or disprove the developer's figures. Words in bold omitted by Mr Vossa. Okay, number one, it is extraordinary that Mr. Vossa did that. Number two, where the hell were the lawyers? In other words, uh, you know, again, you can, you can start to hear the edge about my criticisms of the judge here. In other words, the passage which Vossa purportedly quoted in his report deliberately excised the words which would have shown that this part of the guidance was completely irrelevant to the facts of the case because the bank was not inexperienced, because the contractor was not experienced, because this was not a de small development, and because Watts was not being asked to perform a hand-holding exercise. This was a blatant misuse of a source document in order to pre present a criticism on a false basis. It was clearly contrary to Mr Voss's duty to the court. Triples down, wrong test. In my view, Mr Voss's oral evidence made plain that he was applying the wrong test. He was not looking to see what a reasonably competent monitoring surveyor would have done in the circumstances and to test Watts' performance against that benchmark. Instead, he repeatedly said that what he was doing was setting out what he claimed he would have done line by line, figure by figure. This produced a range of figures between 1.4 and 1.8. There's evidence that this was what he did 
So this is what should have done too. In this way, there were never any margins of error in Voss's analysis, no broader parameters with which in, within which a monitoring surveyor's performance was to be judged. In his view, because they failed to advise the construction costs would be 1.445 million or more, Watts were at fault. Accordingly, I doubted whether his evidence went to the right issue. And again, maybe we do things differently in Sydney, but where the hell were the lawyers? Children, shield your eyes. Unreasonableness. I consider Mr. Vol Mr. Voss's approach was thoroughly unreasonable. The agreed note demonstrated he made no concessions at the experts without prejudice meetings. Harks back to overarching duty. Don't ever tell your expert not to agree to something. Using them instead quite deliberately to raise entirely new matters with this opposite number. In fact, do the opposite. Tell your expert to make concessions so that they are reasonable and appear reasonable. He made no obvious concessions in his oral evidence. Although in his closing submissions, Mitchell accepted one. I observed at the outset of the trial I'd never seen a joint statement between experts that contained no agreement at all. I find that the main reason why is that no such agreement was due to Mr Voss's complete failure to make any concessions at all. And again, it is extraordinary that we are reading these facts and reading these conclusions in a major superior court judgment. Some examples of his unreasonable approach may be noted. One concerned the nature and scope of design warranties. It was put to him in cross that this being a matter of legal rights and obligations, it would primarily be a matter for solicitors. Poor old Mr. Vossa disagreed and said that this was an important matter, for monitor, important matter for the monitoring surveyor. He was plainly wrong about that. The terms of warranties are for lawyers, not monitoring surveyors. It was obviously unreasonable for him to maintain that stance. And again, the name of this matter is not Barry Bloggs versus Watts, it's Bank of Ireland represented by some of the UK's top solicitors. Another example of this unreasonableness concerned the events after. It's a striking feature that the bank's pleaded allegations go no further than the initial report. They make no pleaded criticism to the subsequent reports. And yet despite that, his first and second reports included lengthy sections which were concerned with unpleaded allegations. This was further evidence of unreasonableness. Okay, then the judge helpfully gives us a summary because we couldn't see where the hell this was going. The duties of an independent expert are set out in the well-known passages of the judgment in the Icarian Reefer. For the reasons set out above, Mr. Vossi did not comply with those duties and I was not confident that he was aware of them or had them explained to him. For him it might be said that the Icarian Reefer was a ship that passed in the night. I mean, God, don't we love it when judges go out of their way, having destroyed someone, to then make a pithy little piece of nastiness. The judge then makes a contrast with Mr. Whitehead. But this is actually quite a useful summary of what you want. This is what you want to read about your own expert. You want to read this. Mr Whitehead complied at all times with his duties to the court. I didn't regard him as an advocate. He made proper concessions were appropriate. If, as Mitchell complained, Whitehead's response to Voss's criticisms at the without prejudice meeting was terse, that's hardly surprising. The next case, costs. What happens next? The judge refused to award indemnity costs across the board. He says this, however, and this is critical, leading back to the overarching purpose. It all ties back, and to the fact that costs are now right in play. The exception to which I referred concerned Voss's evidence. I consider that his conduct should be reflected in the costs order that I make. I do not consider that his conduct means that the bank should pay the entirety of what's cost an indemnity basis they lost, in part because of the inadequacies of his evidence. So to order indemnity costs as well would be penalising the bank twice over for the conduct of their independent expert. It would also be disproportionate particularly as, admit, as he admitted that it was the first time he'd given evidence at a trial. There is authority for the proposition that where a court concludes the conduct of an expert should be marked in the costs order, it may be appropriate to order that specific costs generated by that expert be assessed on an indemnity basis. Accordingly, I consider the costs of the defendant's QS expert, Whitehead, should be assessed on indemnity costs, as should the costs occasioned by Mr Voss's evidence and tri at trial. Beyond those two specific exemptions, I consider the appropriate order is that costs should be assessed on the standard basis. In Australia, if this happened, there are some other people who are being referred to in the cost orders, and that is the Mies of this world, and that is their instructing solicitors. But first and foremost, it's going to be pointing at me. Um, there is no question that this judgment, based upon the new federal court rules, or the October 2016 federal court rules, is now moving their way through the jurisdictions that we all practice in. There is, in my view, rightly or wrongly, I would be acting on the basis that a judgment like this which picks off an expert is also at some point going to turn its attention to me rather than the judge thanking me for my wonderful submissions and it's going to turn my attention because after all I called the witness and it's going to turn he's going to turn he or she is going to return her or his attention to the instructors as well over to you John.
Thanks very much. I'm just wondering, based on that last case, whether it's too late to get expert bashing into the Winter Olympics as a new sport, because uh, as a proud POM, it looks like we'll be leading the charge with that case. And this, this is another English case where um, the uh, expert didn't do quite as well as he might have done. Um, EXP versus Barker. Uh, the uh, facts of this case are somewhat different. Dr Barker was the subject of a complaint of medical negligence. Um, the allegation was that he had failed to diagnose an aneurysm. And not surprisingly, there was a wealth of uh, medical uh, evidence led about whether or not that was correct. And Mr Barker, the subject of the complaint, was supported in his defence by the evidence of a Dr Molyneux. Now, uh, what was not clear until it came out in cross-examination was that there was an existing relationship between Mr Barker and his expert, Mr. Dr Molyneux. So what it, in fact it came out in the trial was that Dr Molyneux had trained Dr Barker for seven years uh, during his specialist radiology training, and in particular had trained him for two and a half years as a registrar and senior registrar in neuroradiology. And this was the subject in which they had a special interest and became the subject of the case. It's clear they'd worked together closely over a substantial period and they'd written a paper together for the 14th International Symposium on Radiology, sounds like a riveting seminar, um, a paper not listed on Dr Molyneux's list of publications. And similarly, when Dr Barker, who was of course the defendant, had admitted his CV into evidence, when he uh, listed out the various places that he'd done his training and done his work, he listed under the other hospitals where he trained who he trained under. But when he trained under Dr Molyneux, he didn't list that. So he clearly had very deliberately left that out of his CV. Now that is you know, beyond belief naughty, as we can all see. And unlike um, Vossa, the case that we've just looked at, where clearly the lawyers must have realised long before that got to trial that they had a very serious problem with their expert, it's not clear in the Barker case whether this was clear to the lawyers at all. And in fact, Mr. Barker and Mr. Sorry, Doctors Barker and Molyneux had in fact cooked this sort of um, sneakiness up together, um, and um, it only came out in cross examination. So you can see the uh, the uh, section there that um, um, where the judge uh, sums up on this bit, and it's not quite as uh, scathing as in the other case, but. The comment is that our adversarial system depends heavily on the independence of expert witness, witnesses, on the primacy of their duty to the court over any other loyalty or obligation, and on the rigour with which experts make known any associations or loyalties which might give rise to a conflict. I mean, there clearly was a conflict in this case. Dr Molyneux failed to do so here, despite, despite an express direction to that effect. Indeed, the omission of mention of papers co-authored with darker points in the other direction. Moreover, there's a good reason for doubting his approach to another problem. Now, this goes to uh, a slightly less exciting issue, which is to do whether or not um, he should have disclosed that a piece of evidence that was relied on ha had been subject to criticism elsewhere in the medical profession. Um, but the subsequent conclusion is that in circumstances such as those arising here, the scrupulous expert in Dr Molyneux's position should be pointing out the problems to the legal team well ahead of trial. So the implication here is that this was the expert and not the lawyers. No doubt that will usually be done in privileged communication. In many instances, a court will be cautious in drawing inferences for that reason. However, on the facts of this case, the judge found that Dr Molyneux did nothing. So we, we have an expert and a defendant in cahoots and uh, speaking enough a finding uh, th against the defendant. So that, let that all be a lesson to us. Now, um, I've got some more exciting cases to go through, but I think uh, Tony's got one other, two others to uh, jump in I, with. Just very quickly, very quickly, in less than two minutes, draw your attention to two very fresh decisions um, out of the technology and construction courts in the UK, ICI and Merritt Merrill Technology. An expert should not say that they don't believe a fact that has been presented to them. That's not their role. Um, an, expert, an expert's role is not to decide issues of facts themselves and choose what facts to believe and what not to believe. That's why experts are given assumptions. Um, and an expert who does so risks being described as a cheerleader. Again, this is just simply a useful, this is a very useful fresh authority on when the expert becomes a cheerleader 
through some very subtle mistakes in cross-examination, mistakes that the expert could be prepared for. Don't say you don't believe what you've been presented with. And the second decision, um, 125 OBS nominees and Lendlease. Um, this is, again, a very tight technical point. It's an expert who was retained by one of the parties in a case which involved giant panels of glass falling from a high-rise building onto the street. It became apparent during the course of the lengthy proceedings that some of the documentation that the expert had relied upon was effectively falsified, um, that this was there was an element of falsity. Um, and unfortunately, presented with that fact, <laughs> It was a classic case of the defendant saying on Wednesday what he said on Monday, notwithstanding what happened on Tuesday. Um, the expert was told and knew that these documents that he had relied upon were false. Um, he was asked if it had changed his opinion, and he refused in any way to concede that the fact that some of the documents on which he'd relied and based his opinion could possibly be changed by the fact that it had been proven and accepted by his own damn legal team that the documents were false. Again, useful example. Paragraph nine is where the judges um, go to town on what that what that implicates. It just says that fundamentally, a mistake of that kind means that the experts failed fundamentally in his duties to the court. They do so in nice language, but it's entirely destructive. Back to you, John. All right, so just moving on to have a look at what the court does when uh, it's faced with some expert opinions, but does the court take into account its own opinion? So in Masters and Home Improvement, uh, there's a dispute about the breach of an agreement for lease to construct a Masters Home Improvement store, and the relevant evidence was about the method of calculation for damages. And the court in this case... Um, decided that it really ought to be very careful about what it accepted and what it didn't. And as we can see there, the judgment is that where expert evidence is concerned, the, co the court's role is to evaluate it critically. Where the evidence is cogent, it should not be ignored. In this regard, it's not part of the court's role to bring a third set of opinions into the arena, nor, nor to piece together its own valuation. Just remember that, and I'll come back to another case that's slightly different than that in a second. However, where there is conflicting expert evidence, it may be necessary to accept part of each expert evidence and reject other parts. And in some circumstances, it may be necessary for the court to make adjustments to the conclusion reached by an expert, when that expert's opinion is shown to be flawed in one or more respects or based on an incorrect assumption. Moreover, if after careful examination, the court forms a view that a piece of expert evidence is not cogent, then it may be disregarded. Bearing these matters in mind, it is clear that judges should not take on the role of an expert. If an evaluation of the whole of the evidence demonstrates that the expert's opinions are not well founded, then the judge is left in the position of having to do the best that he or she can is satisfied that the plaintiff has, some has sustained some loss. So in this case, uh, the court had two, different, um, two differing approaches of expert evidence to have a look at, and in the end it didn't really like either of them. Um, uh, accepted a bit of each and sort of, you know, despite those comments, sort of did do a bit of its own view, but in the end said, well, I'm doing the best that I can. This is the best that I can do given what I have and I can't find nothing, so I will you know, take a bit of each and, and find a view. Now, a slightly different approach was taken um, in, a, in another case that I did talk about um, last time we were here, and if any of you have been to all three of our seminars uh, so far on this topic, we'll produce some kind of frequent flyer program so you can get a sort of free coffee after 10 or something. Um, anyway, some of you uh, may remember the very exciting case of State Mercantile and or Oracle, which um, has the uh, uh, wonderful attribute from, of being from the uh, Queensland District Court. Um, and in that instance, um, the judge considered w what you do when you've got a, um, a piece of evidence that goes to something that really isn't a matter for an expert at all. It, it's not quite something of judicial notice, it's not as simple as asbestos is dangerous, but nevertheless, it's really a case of reading a document and forming a view on what that document said, which we all know is not a matter for expert opinion. So in, in that um, case, the judge said, um, for reasons I will set out below, Mr. MacDonald, who was a relevant expert, Mr. MacDonald's analysis was quite superficial to the point where, in my opinion, it is worthless, reasonably scathing, and then went on to say, Mr. MacDonald essentially just compared the gross profit margin relied on by the defendant with the gross profit margin for the defendant's business as a whole, as set out in its published accounts. It is clear that he based his opinions 
on this comparison. Does, but his report does not reveal how that opinion was, is based on his expertise. If the opinion is just based on the fact that the figures are different, then that is obvious anyway. It does not involve any relevant expertise. It is something that I can work out for myself. It becomes a matter of submission, and in that situation, his opinion is inadmissible. So once again, we need to be very careful when we are um, helping our experts or, um, that they're not providing an opinion on something that really is not within their expertise at all. And it is a matter of submission. We can say all those things. We can draw the judge's attention to documents and show how figures are different. Um, but uh, you're starting uphill if you're trying to do that after the judge has already read that in a report and d found that it's inadmissible. So moving on then to some uh, Australians having a bash at um, the Winter Olympics for expert bashing. And we have um, Claude and Claude. Now this is a family law case and the um, circumstances of this case was a dispute about whether some children would be removed from Australia to go and live in America with their mother over the objection of their father. And the relevant evidence was about the interaction of the children with their father, which um, is a very niche area of uh, expert evidence. And um, so niche, in fact, that the court in this case found that the uh, there wasn't really a, a, an expert evidence opinion expressed about this particular issue. And what they had was a, a letter from Mrs B, who was a psychologist, um, discussing how the children got on with their father. And what they said here, as you can see, the letter from Mrs B does not indicate her expertise, although that problem was later cured. The sloppiness of simply attaching the letter, if that was all it was, would have been fatal. But the problem, however, is that there is no way the court is able to discern how Mrs. Ms. B applied her expertise to enable her opinion to be expressed. So she made some comments about the children's relationship with her father based on who knows what, but certainly not um, expressed in a way that made it clear that that came anywhere from her expertise. So that was not allowed in. Similarly, we have uh, rejected evidence in Sharma and Insurance Australia. Again, this is in the medical field where um, the issue was whether somebody who had fallen off a ladder and had sustained some injuries had in fact sustained the injuries complained of or whether in fact they had, were pre-existing injuries. And there's an interesting discussion about um, whether you can accept evidence from a medical practitioner who sees somebody who says, well, this, th this is my history, these are my prior injuries and this is what I've just done whether a, an expert writing that down, does that become expert, the, is that become an opinion? Or is that just writing down a history for, that you've got from a client which you've therefore got to test in another way? There's just a, a discussion in the case about that which is worth a read. But in any event, um, the relevant issue for, for today is the fact that there were some medical certificates provided in evidence supposed to be showing um, doctor's opinion on the um, claiming party. And what the court found is that none of the medical certificates explained how it was that the expert's field of specialised knowledge, in which the witness was expert by reason of training, study or experience, and on which the opinion is wholly or substantially based, applied to the facts assumed or observed, so as to produce the opinion propounded. This is no doubt because in each case the document was a medical certificate, intended for use in employment rather than in a uh, curial context and the medical certificates were unadmissible. So again, you know, there's a lesson for lawyers there. If you've got a medical certificate that's probably produced because somebody may or may not be wanting to um, have time off work, it's highly unlikely that's also going to be appropriate to put in a court as an expert uh, witness report. Then we have uh, coal hub cases. Now these are wildly entertaining. Um, Bit of, a, bit of a good read and um, I think if there is a contender for the silver medal on expert bashing um, the expert in this case probably gets, Mr Biggs probably gets nearly as good as uh, poor old Mr Vossa got in, uh, in the witness box so uh, Mr Biggs uh, was an expert uh, it, it, and this first case of the whole cup was entirely about whether or not his first two reports, in particular his second report, was at all admissible. Um, he was challenged on the basis that um, his reports showed a complete lack of any articulated reasoning. 
and it's a pretty scathing judgment that goes through sort of paragraph by paragraph of his report and explains it with some um, uh, criticism as to why each paragraph basically is complete rubbish and um, um, purports to come up with conclusions and opinions that really are not based on anything. So we have uh, a couple of choice paragraphs here, in particular the, the um, sentence in red, the process of reasoning that leads to the expert's conclusions must be stated or revealed in a way that enables those conclusions to be tested and a judgment made about the reliability of them. And this must be done in chief and not left for the cross-examiner to discover. In my opinion, in critical respects, Mr Biggs's report does not state his reasoning in a manner or to an extent that sufficiently permits scrutiny by the court of his reasonings as opinion and opinions. And uh, this sort of goes on for uh, pages and pages of poor old Mr Biggs, um, including uh, a conclusion that, in my view, Mr Biggs's reasoning is articulated at an impermissibly high level of generality. So he really uh, was not accepted in many ways. Now, then we uh, were closely followed by coal hub number three, which uh, really this one, you know, if you can blame the first one on the expert, you have to blame this one on the lawyers because what happened after number two and his evidence was rejected almost entirely was that they had another go. And this judgment was about whether or not uh, a third report of Mr Biggs, which, you know, was presumably believed to cure the problems wrong with reports number two, uh, one and two, um, whether the third um, piece of evidence should be allowed in. And what do you know? Mr Biggs does not do a better job in round three than he did in the first two. So very unfortunately, uh, after the um, uh, third report is looked at, um, he really didn't do any better. And we have, in my view, Mr Biggs does not state his reasoning in a manner or to the extent that sufficiently per permits scrutiny by the court of his reasonings and opinions. Does that sound exactly like what they said about the second report? There is no exposure of the calculation of the thickness that was utilised in the equation. There is no information that permits me to test and evaluate the steps by which his opinion has been reached. It is not apparent how his expertise has been used to come to the opinions set out by way of these particular numbers. There is a disclosure of reasoning, but it is at a high level. Mr Bennett says that Daz Reef and Hortcher does not require that Mr Biggs provides reasons for reasons. However, in my view, the reasons must descend into a level of detail that discloses the analysis and calculations sufficiently to enable the defendant to test the opinions provided. It's the same thing again. So whatever he did in his third report, uh, he really didn't do a very good job in fixing the problems of the first one. Uh, there were a couple of other um, uh, choice comments. Um, the lack of articulation or analysis or reasoning other than at a high level leaves the defendant unable to properly test the evidence. And obviously that's the, the real complaint from the other side. Um, the lack of reasoning is further highlighted by the reference in the conclusion without explanation to a different figure in a particular table. No sufficient reasoning was deployed to show why that range of figures ha has been uh, settled upon. It is unfair to expect the defendant to elucidate Mr Biggs' reasoning process in the course of cross-examination and then to challenge that process without the opportunity to reflect on it. So it's almost entirely the same complaints as last time. So uh, I, as I said, if Biggs was the fault the first time, Surely the lawyers have to uh, take some responsibility this, the second time because they didn't fix whatever was wrong with this report. So um, in conclusion, I think from all of us, choose your experts very carefully, you know, not only because uh, obviously of their expertise, you know, do they actually have expertise in whatever it is they're giving an opinion about. Um, we didn't necessarily touch on any of that today, but it's, you know, it's still not uncommon for your expert on apples to be responding to an expert report on oranges. If he's an expert in apples, he can't talk about oranges. And his report's not going to be accepted, or it certainly won't be believed, over the expert in oranges. So your expert has to stick to his or her level of expertise and their, their experience. I'm sure we've all met the expert who thinks that they are an expert in everything. So where Mr Vossa was giving um, opinions on legal matters, I'm sure we've all seen experts who do that. And, uh, you know, you have to gently persuade them that that is not their expertise, nor is it their expertise to read, read documents, and nor is it their expertise to have a go at the expert on the other side. So even where you have an expert who is not... Um, can't be criticised for being either the bank's proxy, as Mr Vossa was, or a doctor uh, friends with the defendant, as Mr um, Barker was... 
Uh, they still have to maintain a level of uh, independence that shows they are not adversarial. So even this week, I've been looking at a draft report where my lovely expert, you know, has a real go at his opponent and uses, you know, wonderful adjectives about how irrelevant my, you know, the opponent's evidence is. It's, it's really no good. You know, we've got to, um, it's our job to uh, calm these people down uh, and make sure that their reports are not full of uh, dodgy adjectives and they are just telling the facts and telling their opinion and uh, uh, playing it with a straight bat. So unless you have any questions, which of course I'll be passing to Tony, um, I, think, I think we are done and have a, please have a drink with us. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.